This is Rocky Mountain Edibles. Thanks for joining me. Today I'm in a part of Utah I've never been to before. In fact, the closest I've been to this specific location is about 20 to 30 miles from here. I have a challenge for myself. My challenge is to see if I can survive only on the wild edible plants that I find in this local area. Of course, one of my first priorities is to find a reliable water source. That's not going to be quite as difficult this trip as I anticipated. The reason for that is there have been some recent rainstorms and I have found some ephemeral pools that have collected in the sandstone. I'll show you those a little bit later. I then need to figure out shelter and after that fire. Only when those three things are taken care of will I begin to really intensively focus on the wild edible plants that will sustain me. Stick with me. Let's see how I do. There are a number of these ephemeral pools in the area, and I'm really looking forward to using these as my water source. Thank goodness for the rain. For my shelter tonight, I'm actually going to have an open shelter. I'm going to use a fire pit to keep my body warm tonight. What I need to have is a digging stick to help me clear out a trench in which to build the fire. I broke this dead branch off of a juniper tree. I'm going to use this as my digging stick to dig a trench in which to build the fire. I need to break off some of this other stuff as well. As you can see, there's some of the uh, little stobs from the dead branches that came off of this larger branch. You can see some of the sharp corners here. I need to take those off. I'll probably use a rock um, to take those down a little further. I actually need to dig my trench right here. I needed it to be about body width and I'm gonna have it be about four or five feet long. Now I need to get a fire built in this bed. I really need a nice bed of coals uh, to keep me warm throughout the night and I need the heat of the fire to burn off any residual moisture that might still be present in the sand. For this coal bed to keep me warm through the night I've really got to actually put some rocks along the bottom of the bed and uh, that will increase the thermal mass. Those rocks will continue to release their heat throughout the night. So it's a really important thing. In fact I'm just noticing I need to dig this a little bit deeper here. Oops. Since I decided to do this survival foraging trip in a part of the desert I've never been to before, I wasn't really sure what I would find. As I was walking around, I noticed this ecological niche back behind me that I'm hoping has a great diversity of plants, or at the very least will provide a really great meal for tonight. I just found this dead limb off of a juniper. It's going to be a makeshift digging stick for now until I can find something better. Many of you probably recognize this plant as Sega Lily. I'm going to go ahead and start digging a little bit. With what I showed you in the camera frame a little bit ago, you can tell there's a lot of sago lilies around here, so I'm going to dig up quite a few more for the meal tonight. As I was going around digging up some of the sago lily bulbs, I was reminded of why we need to be so careful about which plants we're digging up and how to differentiate the edible ones from the poisonous ones. I just came across some death camas, and I'll show you a real quick example of how it's different than the sago lily. Right here is the death camas. You can probably already tell some of the differences between sago lily and death camas. You'll notice that the flower is not doing so well on this one, but this is still a pretty good example of what death camas looks like. I'm going to go ahead and dig it up and then have us take a closer look. One of these is death camas. Can you tell the difference between sago lily and death camas? I'm guessing not. Only one of these is death camas. Let's real quick take a closer look to determine how to go about differentiating between the two. This one right here is the death camas. This one is the sago lily. You'll notice that they bear an uncanny resemblance to each other. 
couple of things to point out that is different between them is you'll notice that the stem that emanates from the root of the sago lily is less substantial than is the case for the death camas. I by no means would use that as your defining characteristic to differentiate between these two, but it is a fairly common difference between death camas and sago lily. If you look closely at the leaf of the sago lily, which is this one here, you'll notice that it has a bluish green tint to it, whereas the color of the death camas is much more grass-like green. You'll notice that they have a similar cut longitudinally along the axis of the leaf. The best way to tell the difference between sago lily and death camas is to look at the flowers. In fact, actually, they can look so similar in the pre-flowering stage, I won't even try to harvest sago lily for food, uh, just because it's not worth the risk. I can tell the difference, but if I happen to get it wrong, that's not a mistake I really want to make. There's a reason why death camas is called death camas. You'll notice the sago lily here. It is obviously quite different than the flowers of the death camas. The death camas flowers grow along a raceme, whereas you'll notice that the flower of the sago lily is just one pronounced flower off of each flowering stem. So let's take a look at the bulb of the death camas. You'll notice that it has a very dark skin or coating around the bulb. Death camas is poisonous because the plant contains toxic alkaloids that are harmful to the humans. As I said, there's a reason why it has the moniker death. This is the bulb of the sago lily. You'll notice that it has a dark skin. It's kind of similar in some ways to what you find on death camas. And you'll notice that the bulb of the sago lily is a starchy white, just like the death camas has. So you can see from this example that death camas and sago lily look pretty similar. Once again, if you are planning on using any wild edible plants for food, it's really important to identify any edible plants in the flowering stage, especially if they have poisonous plants that look similar to them. Whenever I'm out harvesting sago lily bulbs, I'll actually take an extra precaution just to make sure I don't poison myself with death camas. So when I get back to camp, if I notice that the bulb of sago lily has become separated from the flowering stem and prevents 100% positive identification, I'll discard the bulb. The bulb of sago lily and the bulb of death camas look just similar enough to each other that I don't want to take any risks. I'd like to see another day. I'd like to be able to continue to enjoy the bountiful harvest that nature provides at certain times of the year. I have some of the materials I collected for a friction fire. I'm going to go ahead and start preparing them. One of the materials I like to use the most for friction fires is cottonwood. So I'm going to actually process this and uh, hopefully get a good friction fire set out of it. I split this cottonwood. Now I'm going to flatten this surface here. I have my piece for my fireboard. I found a piece of willow I'm going to use as a hand drill. Now I need to burn in the hole. And 
next I need to notch this. The next thing I'm going to do is prepare some of this juniper bark so that I can have a nest for the coal. I broke this dead branch off of a pinion pine. It's going to be a bit more resinous and more dense than what I'm using for my drill and for my fireboard. So I just need to flatten the side that will receive the fire drill. And then I need to get some pine sap to put in that once I get the hole burned in. And that will help to keep too much friction from happening at the socket, which is what I don't want. Just cutting in the hole for the socket. This is an old dead piece of sage that I collected earlier. I see a nice diameter section right here that's just straight enough. Hopefully I can get a good drill out of that. I broke off this juniper branch from a tree. I'm going to knock off some of these sharp points here with this rock and uh, try to get it more to my liking for the bow. It has about the right curve that I'm looking for. I'm carrying some parachute cord for this purpose. Popped out just at the wrong time. I have never had this happen before. <laughs> I hadn't yet put in my notch, so I wasn't recording. I was just trying to burn in the hole a little bit, and I got a coal in the fireboard without the notch. So I'm going to try to switch it over to the nest and see if I can blow it into flame. <laughs> That's pretty unbelievable. I've always used a notch before. <laughs> That's how I've gotten all my coals. I need to prepare my tinder bundle with this cottonwood bark. This is really dry. It's great. Jackpot. Yes! I am continuing to actively look for plants. I just had another great find. Let's take a closer look.
is the great find. It's a plant in the Smopterus genus, which if you recall is in the APACA or carrot family. I'm really excited about this one. It's a really delicious edible filled with a lot of starches. There are a number of genera that are closely related to each other that are all edible. Smopterus, Lamatium, Oreoxus, Elides, Mucinian, and one or two others. All of these plants like this are edible. However, you want to make sure that you do your own research and make sure you're positively identifying any given plant. This plant can look like a number of different species, including species that are in totally different families. So please do your research. I am really excited to find this one. This plant is a really delicious one. It has a slight anise flavor and it's really amazing. I have another one back here. You can eat the leaves of this raw. Probably don't want to eat too many of them. Kind of like you wouldn't want to eat too much raw parsley. Most of the plants in the area for the species have actually gone to fruit already. So uh, this is as close as I can get to finding it in flower stage. It's really actually just in the transition moment between flowering and fruiting. Here's a close up of the parsley plant. Remember it's in the Somopterus genus. Really delicious plant. The root is very high energy due to the carbohydrates in it. Here's a close-up of the Smopterus in the fruit stage. You can see that the wings of the fruit are fringed in purple. Really beautiful plant. Anyway, I'm excited to find it. I'll go ahead and talk about this plant as well. This makes a delicious tea and it has ephedra in it. This is actually called Mormon tea. I'm really excited to find it and have a tea with it tonight. Here's the Mormon tea. I'm going to process these a little bit more, chopping them up a little bit before trying to make the tea out of it tonight. As you saw earlier, I already collected some of the wild plants I needed. I got sago lily and a spring parsley. Now I'm going to start looking around this area where I camped last night and I'm going to see if I can find some other plants as well. Maybe I'll find more sago lily, maybe more spring parsley, but I'm hoping also to find a number of other plant species. Let's see how I do. So this is really exciting. I have spiderwort right here. I've done a video about that before. I have wild onion right here. And then right here I have sago lily. So anyway, it's a pretty great find. I'm looking forward to incorporating these plants into my meal tonight. This here is globe mallow. I'm really excited to find it. It's really good in soups or stews. I'm going to harvest some of this to use for later tonight. The flowers are also good fresh. Wow, another great find. It's actually Indian breadroot. Let's take a closer look. Here it is. Such a beautiful plant. This is in the Fabiaceae family. It's actually closely related to prairie turnip. It's in the same genus, in fact. It has a very similar flavor to prairie turnip as well. You'll notice, if you've seen my prairie turnip video, a lot of similarities between this plant and prairie turnip. Similar to prairie turnip, this Indian breadroot starts with blooming purple bluish flowers. And once they dry out, they turn a tawny or yellow color. I'm going to dig this up so we can take a closer look. As I was getting ready to dig up the Indian breadroot, I noticed that there is a Smopterus plant, the same one I actually dug up earlier. Anyway, it's pretty exciting to find two of your favorite plants in the same location. Looks like there are many hundreds of each species of plant. I'm going to look around a little more to just confirm that, but I think I'm going to dig up a few of each plant. Here's a close-up of Indian breadroot. You can see it's a very beautiful plant. It shares characteristics with prairie turnip. You can see it's somewhat hairy on the underside of the leaves and along the margins of the leaves. It has a similar color when the plant is flowering. When the flowers begin to dry up, they turn a tawny or yellow color. You can see that the leaf structure is palmate, with about the same number of leaflets as the prairie turnip. You can see that there's not much of a yield here. These roots actually go very deep. To even get to the part that has any edible value, 
you actually have to dig quite a ways into the ground, several inches, to get to the part that has some of the starches and good flavor. It's not a very economical plant. You expend a lot more calories probably digging it up than you get from eating it. But I did dig up a few because it will help to round out the meal tonight. I just came across a lot of spiderwort. It's a beautiful plant and it tastes absolutely delicious. Before I dig some of it up, let's take a closer look. I just transferred the fire over to my coal bed. It's going to keep me warm for tonight. You'll notice the rocks in the bottom. As soon as uh, these smaller sticks take hold, I'll get some bigger sticks on there. So it was a bountiful harvest. I got several different species of plants. Now I need to start prepping them for the fire pit. This is the plant from the Somopterus genus. The uh, outer skin on this one doesn't peel off real easy. So I just use the back edge of my knife. First one done. Surprising variability in the size of the roots. Of course, that has to do with the age of the plant, no doubt. I can't wait. This one, this one just needs to be eaten right now. If you remember, the leaves have an anise flavor. I'm going to get some of that. Oh, wow. Wow. Man, this is overpowering that starchy flavor that the uh, Smopterus share in common with each other. If you recall, I mentioned if I don't see the flower of the sago lily on the bulb after I harvest them, I'll discard it. The bulb looks so similar to Death Camus, I don't want to take any risks. So I'll get a couple of these ready here. Flowers are absolutely delicious. I chose a selection of some of the best plants of the ones I collected, of the various species I collected. You'll notice there's three of the sago lily bulbs, there's a couple of the bigger Somopterus roots, and then you'll notice this long stringy one is the Indian bread root. Okay, I admit it, I'm looking a little grungy. I wanted to try the first couple of these plants on camera. I'm going to actually start with the uh, bulb of the sago lily. That's uh, the black marks from sap. <laughs> I promise it's not something else. <laughs> I promise it's not something else. So here's the sago lily bulb. I'm going to try it right now. That's really good. Man, that's great. It's excellent. It's really excellent. I'm trying to decide if I prefer it raw or cooked. Of course, cooking it actually releases some of the sugars and makes them digestible. In the raw form, there's a lot that's not digestible, but the flavor of them raw is really great. I think this might be the first time I've had these roasted on a fire for these particular ones. I've eaten them raw a lot. I've boiled them a couple times. This is the Indian bread root. It's very fibrous. Cooking it actually made it even more tough. Being from the same genus as prairie turnip, it would make sense that it tastes very similar in some ways to prairie turnip. When I hit your palate, it is a bit more bitter than uh, is true of prairie turnip. That was really good though, really good. Here is the Somopterus root. Every Somopterus species I've ever tried, I enjoy raw. And honestly, 
in this case. I think I would prefer this one. I think I'd prefer this one raw. Tomorrow I'm going to try to cook some of these in water and uh, see if that really softens them up and pulls out the flavors. Probably because it's such an old plant, it is a bit more fibrous than what I'm used to with Somopterus. Usually Somopterus plants are not really fibrous. Oh, you have to really gnaw on it. Just have to chew it a little bit more. I think it's going to be a lot better cooked in water. Another Sega Lily bulb. I already ate the flour off of it. Mmm. That one's cooked to perfection. This one's a lot better than the other one. It's a younger plant. The core of the root is not so fibrous. Mmm. It's just got a bite with a little bit of black char on it, and that actually tasted really good. This genus was one of the very first that I became interested in um, because of the very nutritious and high carbohydrate content of the root. They never disappoint. Well, maybe the last one did. It was really fibrous, but other than that, they never disappoint. It's now about time to cover over the rocks and the coals in here. I'm going to pull this big piece off. It's just going to be kind of a uncomfortable thing there. If it was going to be really cold tonight, I would build a bigger fire and let it burn longer and probably have more rocks and therefore have a deeper pit. Uh, but I don't really need to do that for tonight. I finished covering over the coal bed. In addition to the wall of rocks on the other side of the fire, I'm building this wall of rocks at my back. The whole purpose of this is to help prevent convective heat loss and to help reflect some of the heat from the fire back onto my body. I've spent many a cold night, and I prefer to avoid that situation if I can. I can really feel the heat from this coal bed. <laughs> I think I'm going to be a roasted turkey by the time this day is over. I think I'm going to go ahead and get some of the wild edible plants that I harvested today and put them on the coals and get them cooked up so I can eat them. Nothing like having a nighttime snack. In case you're concerned that I'm going to be laying on a dirt floor like they did in the Middle Ages, rest assured I'm not going to do that. When I'm on one of my survival trips, I make sure to live in luxury. Let me show you what I'm going to do for my floor tonight. You'll notice that I have long strips of juniper bark. For some reason there's a lot of dead juniper trees right around here, so I was able to peel off a lot of bark from those trees. Anyway, it is this juniper bark that I'm going to be using as my bedding material. I can assure you that I do not have aspirations to be a medieval peasant. I think I'm laying the wrong way. I think my head needs to be on the other side. I better move. <laughs> Made sure to get enough bark to use as a pillow, but I didn't get quite enough to use as a pillow. I'm gonna have to go find some more. One of the advantages of having this juniper bark bed is if a spark happens to land on my mattress, I'll stay really warm tonight. <laughs> All joking aside, I do have to be careful about that. I made sure to keep enough distance between me and the fire uh, to help prevent any concerns about that, um, but I will have to be watchful through the night. I'll be waking up quite a bit to continue to feed the fire. Uh, sitting here makes me think of a memory. It was about 20 years ago, and I was in New Hampshire. Me and this other guy were trying to make a coal fire bed, similar to what we saw in Jeremiah Johnson, and similar to what I did here tonight with this coal fire bed. Anyway, in New Hampshire at that time of year, the soil was really wet, but we weren't going to let anything stop us. So we built our fire inside the pit. We let it burn for quite some time. We put the soil back over the top of the coals. There was a lot of steam coming off the soil because the soil was so wet. And after about two or three hours, we decided that we didn't, weren't seeing any steam. I think we were fooling ourselves though. 
<laughs> we laid our wool blankets down on the ground. And let me tell you something. It was a steam bath all night long. I think I made it till about 4 a.m. And then it was just too much. I had to get up and go about my day. <laughs> Most of you are probably familiar with the idea that the enjoyment you get in the outdoors is in direct proportion to the misery index. And let me tell you something. That night on my first coal fire bed, I enjoyed myself like I never had before. <laughs> Wish you were here with me. It's really great to sit here by the fire, get to sleep by the fire. I have another funny story to tell you. Again, it involves fire. So this was also about 20 years ago, and actually I was at a Earth Skills course. It was a three-month course in New Hampshire. Anyway, about two-thirds of the way through that program, we had built our lean-tos, we had built our fire, chopped all the wood we needed with our axes, and we were really looking forward to the night. Uh, there were four of us around the fire that night, including the instructor. We had a good time that night, just talking, enjoying the fire, enjoying each other's company. And then it was time for bed. And I was sleeping peacefully. We would take turns uh, who would grab the next chunk of firewood and throw it on the flames. Well, at one point I woke up and I felt like something was wrong. Everyone else was asleep. I looked down toward my feet and I'm like, is the grass on fire? And I was like, the grass is on fire. Anyway, I decided I needed to do something about this because I didn't want to have a forest fire. So I go to stand up, but little did I know that both my legs were asleep, like the circulation had gone out of them. And so all of a sudden, to my great shock, I fall and I land right across the fire. <laughs> and the instructor, he wakes up about that time because of the commotion. And as I'm kind of laying there in the fire, remember I'm still kind of groggy and uh, I'm just like trying to get out of the fire, but I'm not having much luck with it. And uh, the instructor wakes up about that time and he's just looking at me and I'm looking at him. And finally I get up off the fire and he told me a little bit later that he was convinced that I had given up. It was just way too hard for me and <laughs> I was throwing myself on the fire, doing myself in. Well. Anyway, I managed to get off the fire, and I put out the clump of grass that had caught on fire, and I went back to bed. <laughs> well, that was a funny experience. I don't think I was on the fire really all that long. I, I mean, it must have only been like two seconds, honestly, but that would have been enough to get some serious burns. I think the one thing that saved me was that I was wearing wool clothing, a shirt and pants that were made out of wool, and uh, those are somewhat fire resistant. And uh, that was a Really wonderful trip. <laughs> Good memory. <laughs> it's wonderfully warm right here. <laughs> One of the joys of sleeping next to a fire is you have to tend it all night long. So you don't necessarily get a full night's sleep. Makes me miss my dad. My dad and brother and I spent a lot of time together around campfires, talking, listening to my dad's stories. Just having a really wonderful time together. Nothing like drifting off to sleep in front of a fire. Well, in case you were concerned, I made it. <laughs> My bed is still warm from the coals and hot rocks that are still in there. About every hour or so, I woke up, started getting just a little bit cold, and so I would put more wood on the fire, and I'd fall asleep for about an hour, wake back up, put more wood on. It was a good night. It's really wonderful to wake up next to a fire. I'm going to collect some of the water from the ephemeral pools and put it in my cooking pot, and then put some of the wild edible plants that I harvested into there, and uh, have something really nice for breakfast. I'll probably roast a few of the roots next to the fire as well, just for a little variety. I need to prepare some of these roots for breakfast. This is the Smopterus plant, or spring parsley. This one is the Sago lily.
Breakfast is almost ready. I have a few plants cooking in water and then a few other plants roasting on the coals. I'm really excited about breakfast. I'm gonna let it cool just a little bit. Well, I poured off some of the water into this cup, partly because I wanted to drink the water and partly I wanted to give the plants a chance to cool down. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and drink some of this right now. Mmm, man, wow. The closest I can get to describing the taste is it's similar to drinking the water after you're done cooking the stinging nettles. I can definitely get the flavor of the Indian breadroot, as well as the spiderwort. Those are the two main flavors I'm getting. I sure wish you could try some of this. It's really good, actually. <laughs> really good. Just going to enjoy some more of that wild plant tea. Okay, I'm excited about this. Really looking forward to breakfast. Oh, I hope you don't mind. I didn't bring any utensils, and they're hard to come by out here, so I gotta eat with my hands. Here's some of the spring parsley. As you would expect with cooking with water, you lose quite a bit of the flavor. It's not bad, but definitely not quite as tasty as it is when you eat it fresh. I put some of the globe mallow in there in the last couple minutes of cook time. Mm. Globe mallow, whether you eat it raw or cooked, has a mucilaginous texture to it. It sounds kind of disgusting, but it's actually really good. Some more spring parsley or somopterous root here. This one's actually a lot better than the last one. It's more tender, has the stereotypical smopterous flavor. What does that taste like, you ask? Well, you'll have to try it, because really it's very unique. One of my favorite cooked edibles is spiderwort root and spiderwort leaves. I'm gonna make myself a spiderwort burrito here. Way better than it has any right to be. Some more spiderwort leaf. Mm. Now this is what I've really been looking forward to. Sega lily bulb is really good when cooked in water, or at least I find it to be so. Mm. If you could try any of the wild edibles that I have on display today, which one would you want to try? Leave a response in the comment section. With this Somopterus plant, or spring parsley plant, usually you'll find them to be at their sweetest and most tender in the early part of spring. As they get a little further along in the late spring, they taste more and more bland, less and less sweet, and they become much more fibrous. This genus and a number of other genera in the EPACA family are called spring ephemerals. They last just for a brief moment in the springtime and then they're gone. You don't even see a trace of them because the leaf structure and the flower structure break off and blow away. And we're getting real close to that time anyway. I think I have a surprise for you. More spiderwort. <laughs> this is more Indian bread root. This one is really delicious. Well, to be honest with you, it probably is a little bit bland, but I'm really hungry and uh, I tend to enjoy all the variety of flavors that nature provides. <laughs> Sad news, last spider work. I need to have some more tea. I actually almost enjoy the water even more than the roots this time. Usually it's the other way around. I love eating the roots of various plants. I have a sago lily bulb I roasted on the coals, but I got so distracted with my water cooked plants and my tea that I think I maybe let it go too long. <laughs> we'll have to see. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just a charred cinder. 
You dare me to eat it? <laughs> oh boy. Tastes like charcoal. <laughs> well, that's kind of a disappointment. Now I have a lot of Sago Lily charcoal particles in my mouth. gonna wash it down with some tea. Even though I managed to burn the bulbs of the sago lily, I am going to still go ahead and enjoy the flower blossoms and also the buds. Delicious. Now for the buds. Found one more sago lily bulb that's been charred. I'll get rid of it. This is the leaf and fruit of the Somopterus plant or spring parsley plant. I'm just going to eat a couple of the buds. Really strong, but not too overpowering parsley flavor to that. And then with the leaves, a bit of a parsley flavor, but also a bit of an anise flavor as well. And I really like that anise flavor. Anyway, this is Rocky Mountain Edibles. Thanks so much for watching. I wish you were here with me to experience all this. It's a wonderful opportunity to get out here in nature. I encourage you to get out in your local area and do some exploring. Please like and subscribe. Always remember harvesting ethic. I only harvested a limited number of plants based off of the abundance I was seeing. Of each species of plants, I saw many thousands of those species of plants. So please make sure you do not overextend a population. If I arrive in a new area and there's not very many plants around, I won't harvest any of the plants because I want all plant communities to be able to continue to thrive. I would encourage you to do the same. Also, please don't use any of the information in this video or any other video as your research for eating wild edible plants. There are a number of other plants that look similar to wild edible plants that are in fact poisonous. It's important to do your own research and make sure you are 100% confident before consuming any wild edible plant. That being said, I would encourage you to get some of the books out there about harvesting or foraging for wild edible plants. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Have a great day.